Thank you. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, your time and uh, attendance today, uh, both in person and online. Uh, I also want to thank HA Proxy for inviting me to speak today. Um, so as Dylan said, I'm from uh, Docker, an infrastructure engineer focusing on Hub. And uh, today, I'm going to be talking about how Docker uses HA Proxy in a cloud-native, highly available uh, Kubernetes environment where we're handling over 80 petabytes of data a month. Um, so quickly, a show of hands, how many people are running HA Proxy on Kubernetes today? OK, a couple. Awesome. Um, so today, the goal is to show some practical scaling techniques uh, that you'll be able to apply to your own environment. It's focusing on Kubernetes, but you'll really be able to apply these designs to any uh, form of platform. Um, so system outages uh, affect the whole business. It's not always just monetary. Uh, you can lose brand confidence, uh, and you can even lose customer data. Um, now, eradicating downtime completely, 100%, is impossible. But what we can do is build a highly available infrastructure so this doesn't happen often. Um, so this talk is going to be broken up into three main parts. Uh, one is going to be Dockerizing HA Proxy and applying that into Kubernetes with some best practice tips. Um, next, some uh, node, availabil node availability topics within Kubernetes. So we're going to cover cluster auto scaling, um, node selectors, blue-green deployment, and over-provisioned nodes. Uh, and then next, we're going to talk about how we scale our HA proxy deployment in Kubernetes. Um, so we're using a tool called Kita for that. So before I begin, uh, what exactly does cloud native mean? Uh, it is a bit of a buzzword, um, and it's an umbrella for all the various tools, techniques uh, that are required to build, maintain, and deploy software on a cloud infrastructure. It's all about building repeatable processes to scale eff eff effectively and efficiently. Uh, shameless plug, but this is why Docker is an integral part of a cloud-native environment. So Dockerizing HA Proxy is really simple. It only requires two files, uh, the Docker file and a HA proxy, HA proxy configuration file, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, this is also a very basic configuration, but it can be extended. Uh, for example, here at Docker, we're extending to install Lua and cron jobs to be able to uh, add extra scripts. So once you have the uh, Docker file, you build the image, uh, then you just push it to any registry of your choosing, hub, or anything else. And then from there, you can just pull directly moving forward. You now have an easily replicatable HA proxy server that will run on any machine with Docker installed. So once that image is pushed to hub, uh, you can just reference that directly in the deployment. Um, so here, again, is a simple manifest, but we're going to be going over some complexities that we've implemented and have helped us build a resilient uh, deployment manifest. Um, so the first thing is you're going, you're going to add a uh, resource definitions to your deployment configuration. Um, so now my next points may sound a little bit counterintuitive, but it has given us great results and has become an in-house best practice at Docker. Um, so when it comes to resource limits uh, for memory, what you're going to do is set requests equal to the limits. Uh, simply put, this is because pods are guaranteed their memory and not their, their memory requests, but not their limits. Uh, this will ensure that pods are not trying to take more memory than is actually available on the nodes, which will cause oom kills and uh, eventually outages. CPU is a bit different. We're actually not going to set limits for CPU at all. And simply put, uh, the reason is because uh, if a pod limit is one-tenth CPU, and it does nothing and sits idle for 10 minutes, for 200 milliseconds, it tries to request two-tenths CPU. What's going to happen is that is just going to be throttled, and it's only going to get the one-tenth that it has a limit for. And since CPU killing isn't a thing, uh, resources will never go over. They're just going to be throttled. So this is why you should really uh, make sure that your resource definitions are uh, tuned specifically to your environments and your applications. If you're more curious about this, uh, a blogger named Nathan Yellen has some posts that will be linked at the end of the presentation, which do a great job of explaining this. So now that we have, uh, the next thing we want to do is uh, we want at least two replicas uh, within different availability zones. Um, so this way, if anything happens to a pod, uh, the other pod will catch it. And if anything happens to an availability zone, hopefully another availability zone will be there to catch it. Um, so this is done with a uh, topology spread constraint. And basically, the topology key is just a Kubernetes zone uh, taint, which ensures a different availability zone. And then the max skew is the number of pods which can be unevenly distributed, uh, which we're going to keep at one. Uh, 
And then when the conditions can't be met in case of some availability outage or something, it will schedule anyways to ensure that high availability. Uh, lastly, we're going to need to set up a rollout strategy. Um, here, this is very simple rollout, um, but it's going to be tuned to your specific environment. Um, at, uh, at Docker, we're using Kita for scaling, so we're not actually using this. We're going to be, I'll, I'll go over some more complexities that we use uh, for how we scale. So the first, now that we have a reliable HA proxy deployment, uh, the first node availability topic I want to cover is the cluster autoscaler. So this essentially just increases or decreases the nodes automatically based on the requests. Again, the requests, not the limits. Um, this has a very low overhead to set up, and uh, this is just a quick overview of how, how it works. Um, when pods are in a pending state because there isn't enough resources, uh, the cluster autoscaler will be triggered, uh, notified, and then it will provision a new node. Once that new node has been added to the cluster, uh, the pods will then begin scheduling onto that node. Um, so you'll, you won't need to worry about node resources uh, when scaling your workloads. Um, again, it's also good to have a minimum and maximum number of nodes set for this, uh, because we don't want to be uh, dropping any traffic due to misconfiguration, and we also don't want a massive AWS bill at the end of the month. Um, so the next topic I want to cover is uh, node, avail uh, node types. Um, so here at Docker, we have tons of services across our clusters, and we're using HA proxy as our API gateway, uh, serving all of this traffic. So our routing infrastructure is hit a lot. We've made this flexible by using dedicated node groups. Um, so in order to set up a de dedicated node group, uh, the first thing you're going to do is set taints on your nodes that you want to apply this to. Um, this can be done very simply with the CLI command here. Um, but for a long-term solution, you'll definitely want to add this in your infrastructure as code. Um, so once the nodes have been tainted, uh, you can explicitly tell the deployment to only run on these, uh, on these nodes. And this is done by setting tolerations and tolerations and affinities to your uh, workloads. So basically what this says is basically we will only run this workload on a node with this taint. And a taint is essentially just a label. Um, so this ensures that all of our HA proxy, for in this case, are running on these specific node groups. And this has given us three main advantages. Um, so it's given us an increased cluster fault tolerance because we don't have any other resource-intensive workloads being run on these nodes. It's only meant for HA proxy and other daemon, daemon sets that are meant to support the cluster. Uh, it also provides us with more flexible scaling um, with HA proxy because the nodes are now scaling separately from the rest of the services. And lastly, it gives us better node tuning uh, to put on the nodes because, as we know, HA proxy uses more CPU than memory. So what we can do is use an, like an EC2 instance that is meant for compute intensive workloads. So this way that our resources are scaling more efficiently and supporting HA proxy better. Uh, this strategy can also be used for many different services uh, and uh, types, uh, and it's very powerful. Um, so following from the previous topic, going, I'm going to demonstrate how we're using node groups and node selectors in order to have a blue-green deployment model. Now, for those of you unaware of what a blue-green deployment model is, uh, it's a deployment technique which reduces downtime by essentially having two near-identical environments, uh, blue and green, and where one is typically inactive uh, when it's not being used. So the inactive color is going to be modified or upgraded, and then the traffic is going to slowly point to that and shift the, shift the traffic. This ensures that pods don't need to roll over and drop those connections. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick visual of how this works. Uh, so as we see here, 100% uh, of our traffic is going to our blue node group. Um, and they're both on version 1. So we're going to run our CICD pipeline, and we're only going to upgrade our green uh, node group. And once that's upgraded, we can start running some tests. We can make sure that everything's running properly, everything's working how it's supposed to be. And once we have those confirmation, we can slowly start shifting our traffic from the blue node group to the green node group. And you can do this using a weighted DNS record to be able to shift the traffic. And this will also allow us to, to, uh, to ensure that our traffic is, uh, that our green application is functioning properly. So we're slowly going to just shift it all until eventually it is, all of the traffic is now going to the green, where the blue node group can now go idle. 
and we can upgrade that and make sure that this is on the same version. Um, prior to this, we had pods rolling over and nodes rolling over for, for major upgrades, and this was causing us to drop some traffic. Uh, this technique is really useful for things like Kubernetes node upgrades or major versions of HA proxy upgrades that require a full redeployment. So the final topic of node availability I want to cover is over-provisioning. Um, so basically, as the name sounds, it is uh, basically extra idle nodes waiting to pick up pods. Uh, and this is done by tricking that cluster autoscaler we went over before into provisioning an extra node. Um, and the way this is done is actually very simple. It's done by setting a, a deployment, which is a pause deployment, and it essentially does nothing, and a priority class with a negative value associated to that deployment. What this allows for us to have is a deployment that will just take resources and make sure that there is an extra node being available at all times. So you may be asking, why are we using a real deployment in order to achieve this? And one of the reasons this is, is because uh, other than CPU and memory resources, other resources can be exhausted, which can cause pods to not start up. Um, for example, an IP address when using VPC CNI in Kubernetes. Proper monitoring will allow us to, to let us know when a pod uh, is not able to start before it hits production. Uh, the drawback to this, of course, is that you're now paying for extra nodes to sit idle. So before considering the solution, you'll definitely want to weigh your availability concerns with your cost concerns. So these five components to a cloud-native uh, Kubernetes environment gives us uh, HA proxy running on a multi-replica resilient deployment on Kubernetes. It gives us horizontal auto-scaling uh, of your nodes to fit your resource requirements. It's going to give us dedicated node types for flexible scaling, increased cluster fault tolerance, and improved node tuning. An over-provisioned node for quick startup and insurance that pods can run. And lastly, a blue-green deployment model for Kubernetes and HA proxy upgrades. So this is great, but how do we scale our workloads to match our node dynamic scaling? And when we found uh, Kita, a CNCF pod auto-scaling tool, we knew we had found our solution for our scaling requirements. So there is a horizontal pod auto-scaling tool native to Kubernetes as it is, called HPA. But this only, ba this only uses internal events, such as CPU or memory usage. Um, to function, Kita has two main roles. And uh, it uses the Kita agent in order to scale uh, to and from zero. And then it uses the metrics adapter to expose external metrics to the HPA native in Kubernetes. This allows us to scale based on any external metric. Uh, Keto works with multiple workloads, such as jobs, deployments, stateful sets. And it is, off, it, uh, it is very extensible. It supports over 50 different services. So if you want to scale maybe based on uh, Redis jobs or S3 metrics, anything like that, you can scale this completely dynamically. It also uses Prometheus, which, again, allows you to basically scale on any form of event. Um, so we use Kita to scale HA proxy dynamically, and this is what our triggers look like. So we're using CPU uh, at 80%, which is an internal metric, and then we've, we've been using uh, 3,000 active requests, uh, an external Prometheus metric that we pull in and expose to HPA as another form of metric. If either of these are true, we scale up by one, and then we wait a stabilization period. Fine-tuning this is going to be very unique to your own environments. Um, and these are the numbers that we came up with uh, that we saw the best performance and uh, best latency with our systems. But again, they may be different for you. Um, this also provides a more elaborate rollout strategy than previously discussed. Uh, so it has additional configuration available, such as minimum and maximum set. Uh, triggers based on any internal or external event, uh, stabilization periods to ensure that you're, once that's rolled out, uh, that the metrics can adapt and breathe to the new, uh, the new rollout. And then it also has a fallback procedure in case anything happens to Kita to make sure that everything's running properly. Um, so if you're looking into scaling any form of Kubernetes uh, workloads dynamically, I definitely recommend this tool. 
Uh, in conclusion, uh, Docker runs a highly available HA proxy environment uh, with dynamic scalability and resilient node infrastructure. This allows us to efficiently scale above 30 to 40,000 requests a second while generating over 80 petabytes a month uh, without dropping any traffic. By applying these techniques, we are better equipped to, to protect Docker's reputation and meet the needs of our customers, some of who I'm sure are in the audience today. Uh, many of the system designs I outlined today uh, can be applied to your own environments and at your own respective organizations to ensure that your products are built on a strong infrastructure foundation. Because let's face it, nobody wants to get that 2 a.m. call uh, that your system has gone down. Thank you all for your time and attention. Um, I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Otherwise, feel free to contact me via email anytime or talk to me throughout the uh, conference. Big round of applause for Ryan. Give it up. Great job. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Just as before, raise your hand nice and tall so uh, one of our speaker runners can come out to you. And you can also submit questions in the stream chat and also on Twitter if you use the hashtag AJProxyConf. So we did already have a couple questions in the stream, so I'll start with those. The first, as much as you can share, what is your team planning to accomplish next with building and maintaining the Docker Hub infrastructure? Um, I think I can share this. Um, <laughs> so the, one of the next big projects that we're starting to work on at Docker Hub for our infrastructure is a service mesh. Um, so we've actually chosen Linkerd to uh, apply to our Kubernetes clusters for that extra visibility and observability into our cluster. Uh, it also provides us with mutual TLS, uh, which is great uh, for security. Um, along with that, we're starting to talk about uh, multi-cluster uh, and multi-region Kubernetes clusters with HA proxy and scaling that out more globally. Great. We have a question here. Hello. Um, did you run into issues related to cross-node traffic uh, impact on the network stack of your Kubernetes node? Because I have seen that in very similar deployments. And how, how do you deal with it, especially if you have multiple availability zones and then you have to care about peering cost between your availability zones and things yes. like that? Um, that's a good question. Uh, we have not faced that problem in our systems, um, but I can get back to you on that uh, throughout the conference. So we have another question on the stream. Do you use dedicated HA proxy clusters outside of Kubernetes to avoid SPOF? SPOF. Um, or SPOE. It might be a typo. SPOE. I am... I'm, Single point of failure, I see. sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, do we, no, we are running our HA proxy within the, um, within the cluster um, of our services. And we have multiple uh, node groups uh, responsible for this and multiple deployments uh, to try to not have that single point uh, of failure. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, have you, you. ever faced uh, any issues uh, with HA proxy with backend size? Uh, you, know, with, you can have a different uh, state of, uh, of your configuration between different ingresses, mean that one ingresses could have uh, means 10 backend and, and another nine only? Yes. Um, yes, we. You solve it? We, we, have faced this, uh, we have faced this before in the past. And one of the ways that we solved it was we started using um, console template in order to reload our configurations and to sync them. And we also used the CTST uh, plugin in order to pull the backend servers uh, for, for the backends. And then on top of that, we were able to use uh, the HA proxy state file, um, which would save the states uh, during a rollover. Um, and this helped us a lot with uh, not dropping, those, dropping that uh, traffic. Excellent. So that's all the time we have for Q&A. Uh, again, Ryan, you'll, you'll stick around so you can, you can speak to him uh, during one of the breaks, or he also gave his contact information. Once again, a big round of applause to Ryan. Thank you.